Hello guys, I'm Carlos Hermida, the director of the Save Nafka project. And today we are here to talk to you about an extremely interesting topic, which are the different theories that have been developed about the Nafka lines. But for this, I will not be the one to talk to you about this wonderful topic, since here we have an exceptional person, and she is none other than the doctor in art history, Ana Mafe Garcia, co-author of our scientific article, and she is the one who has been in charge of the state of the art section of our article. Though, what is the state of the art? Well, no more and no less than the different theories about the Nazca lines, who discovered them, what has been said about them, and what was previously believed until now. And I leave you in good hands, because Anna Maffei is not only the winner of an international best paper for our scientific article, something already quite extraordinary in itself, but she is also the winner of another international best paper, given that she is the world's greatest expert in the Holy Grail, that cop so sought after throughout history, and has published a book titled under the same name. And without further ado, I leave you with her. Do enjoy, because the matter of the Nazca lines explained in her own words is extremely interesting. And here we go. Interestingly, we all ask ourselves the same question, who made the Nazca lines famous? And this is where researchers look into the state of the art. In the world of literature, one can make the distinction between fiction, in the form of fantasy or pseudoscience, and then there is scientific literature. Let's first address the question of who made these lines famous. Well, there is a man in the late 1960s who was arriving in Nazca by plane, one of the first times that a plane was flown in the area, and he spotted these lines and these shapes. His next best idea was to write a book about his insights. Erin Rungen and the Zunkuft, also known as Chariots of the Gods, Unsolved Mysteries of the Past by Eric von Daniken. Since 1968, he has sold more than 20 million books, claiming that the Nazca lines were land in strips for the aliens. Of course, there are successors to Eric von Daniken, and one of them is George A. von Bronig, who, as you can see, represents Nazca by means of a balloon and a kind of boat. And he tells us that these gigantic effigies, symbolizing divinities, were intended to be observed from above, and justifies it in such a way that this book from 1977 somehow inspires consecutive publications to carry on discussing the reason for the Nazca lines. George von Brunig, also of German origin, speaks of the pre-Columbian Olympiads. Would they have taken place in Nazca? And in his work, published in Interciencia, which is a magazine with based in Caracas, Venezuela, he argues that they are some kind of running tracks and that they could form part of the site where these pre-Olympics would have been held. In 1983, Henry Sterling, with his publication Nazca, The Solution to the Archaeological Enigma, says that these straight lines served as weaving looms, and their shapes had a protective purpose. It is clear that all of these theories have in common that they are none other than opinions. But when one engages in science, one has to use the method. One has to be able to replicate, in a way, those ideas that we may have. In regards to the state of the art of the Nazca lines, if we start to consider it scientifically, we can say that there are different theories that do more or less make sense. The first time we have any notion of the Nazca lines is in 1568, when the corregidor Luis Monzón speaks about the explorer Pedro Ciencia de León, who reported his sightings of the lines and he refers to some paths. But who really starts to focus on, let's say, the crux of the matter, and the one who begins to work properly in the field is the Peruvian archaeologist Toribio Mejiaespe. In 1927, while hiking, he spots these lines from the top of the hill. It is a false assumption that these lines are only visible from high above. What does it mean? Well, that while he discovers that there really is a human effect, an anthropized terrain, he begins to carry out his own research and ends up submitting a paper at the 27th International Congress of Americanists, held in Lima, where he talks about ancient aqueducts and roads. 
en el 27 Congreso Internacional de Americanistas, celebrado en Lima, donde ya habla de acueductos y caminos antiguos. And it is very interesting because this concept of linking water to Nazca is somewhat left behind because at the start of the 1940s, during the Second World War, you find some people who are studying in Nazca, especially the American historian Paul Kozak and his disciple Maria Rage, who explained that the lines are calendars that allude to the positions of stars, the sun and the moon, and evidently some of these geoglyphs do have to do with the sunrise and sunset, but it is not the definitive solution. Also in 1942, John Roach speaks of them as centers of worship, and another disciple of his 60 years later once again claims that they are astronomical calendars. In 1994, the United Nations Committee, via UNESCO, declares these lines as a World Heritage Site. Since that point onwards, there seems to be a little bit more order in place. This said, I can affirm that Maria Rach is actually the great ambassador of the Nazca lines. This woman ends up becoming nationalized, an endearing Peruvian. Researchers such as Alex Gianetti, who is one of the great researchers who was in the National Geographic and so on, speaks very fondly of her, and this woman, through her means, talks about how the geoglyphs were mainly created for astronomical purposes. She speculates that they may represent constellations, but makes two mistakes. One is to think that all the geoglyphs were created in the same time period, and the other is that her understanding of astronomy is limited to the Northern Hemisphere, because she is of course European. For example, when she refers so many times to the Pole Star, which is the star that belongs to the Ursa Major. In short, there is quite a major flaw here. Thomas Morrison proposes that these stone mounds piled together represent the Wakas, which were sacred sites. These are closely related to the studies that were done on the Thekas, something that is actually Incan. And these are described as lines that unite the city of Cusco with other sacred places. And within these important studies, there is also Raychard, who tells us that these lines are related to an associated ritual aimed at extracting the waters from their underground sources. However, he leaves the theory hanging and does not know how to substantiate this. Anthony Aveni is the originator of what we call archaeoastrology, and he refutes Maria Rach and defends that it's not exclusively about astronomical phenomena. In fact, Aveni and Silverman adopted a more holistic understanding, so they tell us that, yes, the Nazca lines have to do with the ancient world, but it can be interpreted in many ways, and social and religious factors must be considered. They associate the lines with the water thanks to the previous study that I had mentioned. However, not until Luis Cabrejo arrives and talks about how the Nazca lines are a hydraulically connected network, can we not confirm that the issue begins to be addressed properly. Thus far, the looms and the alien runways are debunked. And so much has been debunked that eventually Luis Cabrejo, a computer scientist with no knowledge of civil engineering, textually declares that there should be an interdisciplinary council dedicated to studying these issues. And this is when our colleague Carlos Hermida will come in and explain that this multidisciplinary team is what he is actually creating at a global scale. Lastly, what are the latest of the latest developments in the field that have been told thus far? Well, none other than the latest contributions from researchers at the Yamagata University in Japan. According to their theories, which go back right to the beginning, to what was talked about in 1927, and this would be the pilgrimage routes to the pre-Incan city of Kawachaki, in connection with these thicker paths that I have told you about. And in fact, they are so convinced that this is the case that, well, they somehow end up classifying these into four different types of geoglyphs, which would be the focus of their study.
o estudio. That said, the article we've published talks about the lines of NAFTA, and we also make a comparison with the Pampa de Oca in what is our section on the state of the art. And the introduction for this article is pretty much what I've talked about. The state of the art within this scientific context are the main lines of research and how they have been refuted. In the analysis of the theoretical orientation and objectives of this study, the astronomical interpretation is rolled out and there is the analysis on the distance between clusters. And then there are the objectives of our study, the methodology followed and conclusion, which our colleague Carlos will take us through. And here is a very interesting study that I will now like to discuss. Why do I choose this article? Because here Pablo Solis Quinteros from the University of Granada makes a very interesting statistical study on the construction patterns. And then in the state of the art, he expresses in a few words that he is inclined to think that there indeed was a ceremonial use. Then he reviews Maria Reich's past work, but he doesn't contribute anything else to this hydric aspect that we, the Safe Nazca team, are focused on. Objectives and methodology. The objective of this study we have presented is to analyze each piece of masonry by applying reverse engineering in order to know its individual function, something that to date no university has done. Everything said so far has been guesswork, but the Japanese are who really dedicated their time to cataloging these pieces as the roots that they really are. What methodology has been used to carry this out? Well, it has been a very long process that has lasted years. We're talking about almost a decade of work that concludes here and now in this Congress presentation, which is why we are so over the moon because it has been extensive hours of work. And so we have relied on CAD mapping with the purpose to define 2,500 square kilometers with more than 3,750 satellite images, which altogether has created a mosaic that has been mapped line by line and we can confirm that any inaccuracy in this mapping doesn't exceed the 40 centimeters, and this is within the vast number of square kilometers. Every geoglyph, every line has been accurately retraced. And I will now hand the spotlight over to Carlos Hermida, the engineer who has, by all means, led this study by virtue of discipline and engineering. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the presentation on the Nazca lines, and now it would be my turn to speak and explain to you all what our scientific article actually consists of. But as I always say, we'll save this for future videos. And of course, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so yet. Don't forget to click on the bell to be notified notified on upcoming episodes that will take you closer to the answer to the big question. What are the Nazca lines? I am Carlos Hermida and this has been Save Nazca. Solo en YouTube.